Um, so let me introduce Oliver Mosh. And uh, well, Oliver is at, um, I don't think he's Italian, but he speaks Italian. And he's in PISA, uh, CNR at PISA. And uh, he works on rebirth atoms for a long time. And uh, we, we had some initial projects that was supposed to come to fruition, but somehow it is out. But in any case, uh, Oliver has been working uh, a lot on coal atoms uh, the last how many years, decades. And uh, today he would like to give us a talk on uh, dissipation control for rebirth atom tronics experiments. So uh, Oliver, when you are ready, just kick it off. Okay. Uh... Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, as the case may be, uh, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Quack, for this uh, introduction. So let, let me uh, join all the other speakers in thanking Luigi and his uh, colleagues for putting up a very exciting conference, uh, as has been said before, the next best thing to actually being there in person, although I'm also very much looking forward to seeing uh, many of you in person again in the not too distant future. Now, um, before I start my actual talk, let me acknowledge the, the people who worked on this, at least there's a number of people, especially the ones that did most of the experiments that I'll we'll talk about, Matteo Archimi, Cristiano Simonelli, and Marco Di Stefano here in Pisa, but also uh, a list of collaborators, and I've left out some, not, not to make the list too long, Ilya Begarov and Igor Yatsev in Osibirsk, and also Luigi Amico, Tobias Hauk, and and as when Quack said, uh, there was hope of getting a project uh, approved together, but you know, maybe that's for the future. And also Igor Lesanovsky in Tübingen, who's a long time collaborator. Now, let me start by uh, telling you a little bit about what uh, Rydberg Atomtronics, uh, which you gathered from the title, is probably something you maybe haven't heard about. Uh, so don't feel bad if you haven't. Uh, just go to your favorite search engine and uh, type in Rydberg Atomtronics and you will get uh, zero results. Uh, actually, the suggestion is to try Rydberg Animatronics, which is a thought. Um, so uh, it's maybe for the future. In any case, uh, you may not have heard about Rydberg Atomtronics because that's something that uh, Luigi Amico and uh, I came up, I think, a bit more than two years ago before the last in-person Venask uh, meeting. And so we tried to find some common ground between my interest in, in Ripley physics, which is you know, not, not so recent, but you know, dates back a few years before that I worked a lot on optical lattices in DC. So you know, there was some exposure also to what is now called atomtronics. Um, so we thought, you know, how can we put, put these two, two, two together? And you know, just a Mickey Mouse picture of atomtronics, uh, so forgive me if I oversimplify here. So, you know, you have uh, atoms or you know, matter waves and they somehow propagate in, in some circuits that you define. And then you maybe split them, you know, and then you recombine them and you do some interference experiments, you know, and all the wonderful stuff that we've been hearing about. And so the idea was to do something very similar, but uh, this time use a fixed arrangement of, of atoms so those could be held in dipole traps or in any kind of other trap, or they could even just you know, hover in the air for sufficiently long so that you can do experiments. Um, and now what actually propagates is not the atoms themselves, but it is uh, a Rydberg excitation. Okay, so you might start by putting a Rydberg excitation here, and this could then propagate through this geometry of, of atoms. <clears throat> and then maybe recombine to then get interference effects and so forth. And together with Luigi and, uh, and Tobias uh, and other people in, in Singapore, we had already thought about you know, what we could do uh, with, with this. So we could do uh, transport experiments, you know, source brain type experiments. We could uh, define sort of transistor arrangements or diodes. <clears throat> and so there's lots of interesting things that we hope to do in, in the next few years funding and time permitting, obviously. Um, but let me just briefly introduce Rupert Atom to those of you who are not uh, that familiar because this community uh, you know, does not really contain a large Rupert fraction, shall we say. 
but you know it's growing and there are more people getting interested in this. So if you take your, your usual ground state atom with a small principal quantum number, four, five, six, seven, or what have you, you know, that, that's a, a very small uh, object, you know, below a nanometer or so. But if you go to a Rydberg state, i.e. a state with principal quantum number that's above, you know, 15 or 20 uh, or so, then due to the scaling uh, of the, the size of yours is n squared, the ionization field that you need in order to field ionize, which we'll come back to in a second, it actually drops very quickly with n to the uh, minus four. And the two quantities that are most interesting for us are, are the lifetime of that object that uh, goes as the Q of the principal quantum number and the Van der Waals coefficient, which tells you how strongly these atoms interact by the Van der Waals interaction, which actually gives us n to the 11th, which is enormous. So to give you a quick example, for the rubidium atoms that we work with uh, around n equals 70, which is a typical quantum number, uh, we have megahertz interaction uh, energies at you know, really large distances of around 10 mic uh, micrometers and lifetimes around 150 microseconds compared to you know, tens or hundreds of nanoseconds in the low light states. Right, and now these Rippling atoms, they have been shown by us and also by many other people, I'll just refer to some of our experiments here, uh, to give rise to very strongly correlated dynamics. Uh, the most prominent of those are, are the Rippling brocade. So when you try to drive uh, on resonant uh, transitions between rippling atoms, you know, in a, in a collection of atoms, then you actually get an excluded region by the fact that you have this uh, interaction potential between the atoms. And if you put a rippling atom somewhere in, in your ensemble of, of atoms, then this will create a blockade radius where the uh, Van der Waals interaction is so strong that no further excitations will be possible or will be very, very unlikely. And, and so this is a sort of anti-correlated dynamics, vice versa. If you drive this transition off resonantly, so you put some tuning, then you actually get a sort of inclusion region. So uh, to first approximation, uh, excitations are very unlikely because you're driving off resonantly. But now if you have two atoms at just the right distance, right, so one atom very close to an already excited atom, then you can have so-called facilitated excitations. And, and this can be measured uh, through the dynamics and also through the, the fluctuations. So they're very prominent in the Mandel Q factor, which becomes very large and positive for this facilitated excitation regime. And it becomes negative, uh, so these are gray dots here, for the blockade regime. And we can also study uh, spatial correlations. So we did an experiment where we created a cluster of rubric excitations initially, very close together, and then observed as they flew apart uh, under the influence of the Van der Waals interaction. So we call this Van der Waals explosion, as you can see here. Uh, so the size <laughs> of this cloud grows uh, once we've excited the atoms initially. Okay, so that's the kind of things that, that we can do and that we think will be uh, you know, a useful starting point for this Rippling atom tropics. Now, what I want to tell you about today is, <clears throat> uh, or, or rather ask the question, how, how ideal is our model? Okay, so when we want to do these experiments, obviously we have to make sure that this approximation of having atoms in the ground state and in the Rippling state, you know, sort of a, a binary model, uh, like a two-state model, a ground and excited state, uh, how realistic is that? Now, so we want to have these two states and we somehow want to drive transitions between them, right? We want to control this uh, two level uh, system. Now, first of all, typically you uh, cannot go directly from the ground state to a Rippleck state, certainly not from, a, from an S ground state to an S excited state uh, with a dipole transition, but also because you would need, even if you went to a P state, you would need UV light and that's not very, very nice. So typically we have an intermediate state, which we are slightly retuned from. And so we have an, uh, an effective uh, Rabi frequency via this uh, retuned intermediate state. And, you know, for now we, we can forget about that, right? So that's not a, a very, uh, very strong deviation from our two state model. You know, it's just a technical detail. What gives us a deviation, obviously, is uh, spontaneous decay, right? 
So we already said these atoms live very long, hundreds of microseconds, but eventually they, they will decay. But that again is not necessarily uh, such a big problem. It, it can also be a very nice feature and an interesting model to study, which is a driven, a driven dissipative model, which we uh, investigated together with Igor Lezanovsky uh, a few years ago, where we actually um, saw experimentally an absorbing state phase transition uh, due to the competition between uh, facilitation, these facilitated excitations, and spontaneous decay. Right? So this was a model actually for epidemic spreading. This is how we advertised it uh, in our talks until two years ago, and then for obvious reasons, uh, we stopped. Okay, so spontaneous decay, I'll come back to later. That's also not, not such a big problem. What does turn out to be the bigger problem is this. So if you look at these Rutberg states, and uh, for now I'll only consider MS Rutberg states, and you look at principal quantum numbers between about 60 and 110, which is what we usually work with, then uh, you, you'll notice that you know there are obviously lots of other Rutberg states nearby, uh, and the nearest ones are the MP and the minus uh, 1P states, and, and there are only you know a few to a few tens of gigahertz distant from that uh, original Rupert state that you're interested in in the two-state model. And obviously black body radiation will now induce transitions to and fro uh, between uh, your target Rupert state and, and, and these nearby NP states. But then obviously once these NP states get populated, Rupert uh, black body radiation will induce transitions to S states and to D states. And from the D states, you can go to the F states and you, you, get, you get the picture, right, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, a huge deviation from our simple two-step model. So now the question is, the answer to the, the, the initial question is, well, you know, how good is, uh, how ideal is our model? The answer is not very, but since we're experimentalists, the first thing we want to do now is we want to measure this. We want to see what we're actually dealing with in, in the experiment. And, and the way, uh, just to give you a technical detail, how we measure these things is we start from ground state atoms in the heat optical trap. Then we shine on a laser beam, or actually two laser, laser beams as you now know. We excite a, a target Rupert state, you know, this could be a 70S state, for example. And we switch off the laser, you know, we have a few excitations. And in these experiments, we, we only excite very few uh, Rupert atoms, like between one and three. So it's, you know, a statistical distribution, but the, the average value is around two, because we don't want any interaction effects or anything like that, right? We want to be in the single atom regime. And, uh, and then we count how many Rupert atoms we have by simply switching on an electric field. It doesn't have to be very big because the uh, ionization pressure is very low. And, and these then get accelerated to a charge multiplier. And we just read off on an oscilloscope every time that an ion arrives that was previously a Rupert atom. Okay. So in, in this way, uh, what you actually measure is not the population of this uh, single target state that uh, you initially populated, but if you make that measurement not right after the excitation, but sometime later, you will actually measure all this stuff here. Right? Now, there are schemes that uh, include a, a ramp in the electric field, so you ramp it up slowly or slowly enough so that you can uh, see the individual uh, ionization thresholds of the different states. But in this regime where we're working at between n equals 60 and, and 110, that's virtually impossible. You know, it's very, very difficult to tell these states apart. And so in most experiments also, there are some in the literature where people got things wrong, as we did also because we weren't aware of this. And what you really measure is what we call the state ensemble. Okay, so if you do a simple field analytic measurement, uh, then you get this, this number, which is valid. It's, it's the number of Rupert states in total. Uh, so the initial state plus all the states that get populated by black body radiation. And I should say, I neglected this here, of course, all these uh, and P and S and D and F states, they also decay spontaneously, right? Otherwise this would live forever. Uh, these decay spontaneously and, and they each have their own uh, individual spontaneous decay rate. And so what you measure is a figure like this. Right? This is the number as a function of time. And you can fit 
an exponential curve to this. Actually, it turns out that it's not a single exponential, but I won't get into details here, uh, as you would expect. And you get a, a number out of this. But this, as I said, is not really what we're interested in. We're, we're interested in uh, seeing how long this target state lives. Now, we don't have access to that directly, but what we do have access at is another access to is another quantity, which we can get by performing exactly the same experiment, but now just before doing the field ionization, we shine on a laser beam that is resonant with the transition between the rip-rap state that we're interested in and the intermediate state I showed you before, which obviously decays very fast, 100 nanoseconds or so to the pi of s state. And so we can effectively depump atoms out of that selectively out of the rip -rap state. Okay, so that's something it's very selective because it involves a laser beam. So that's you know, the bandwidth is only a few hundred kilohertz. So we can really just pick out uh, this particular state here. And so we have to be careful not to drive this too strongly because otherwise we see uh, Rabi oscillations, right? So we have to drive this just fast enough so that you know, the, the bottleneck uh, here of the 6P state is, is overcome. So that's actually the fastest time scale. And then we just depump the atom. So in, in a few microseconds, all the atoms can be de-excited from, from this target group. So now we do field ionization after that depumping, and we're left with what we call the support of our original state, which is all the ripwreck states that get populated or that got populated by black body radiation minus the initial ripwreck state. Okay, so we make the measurement, and uh, you can see the blue uh, dots here. So the start. Well, the zero actually is missing here, but they start at zero, obviously. And, and then they get populated, the support gets populated over time, and then also decays, and at some point you know, is indistinguishable from, from, the, uh, from the ensemble. Well, and now it's just a matter of simple maths, right? We just do ensemble minus support, and we get the target population. Right? So just subtract those two numbers, and that's the green line here. Very good. Now, Let's first of all uh, do a calculation, and we did this using the, the ARC or ARC um, distribution by the group of Charles Adams, uh, Python, which is very useful for this. So we just calculated uh, as a function of the principal quantum number the uh, first the target lifetime uh, of our S states, and then also the ensemble lifetime. Okay, and then measured those quantities for the different principal quantum numbers. And this is what we get for the for the ensemble. So for the ensemble, we get something that you know is very reasonably close to the uh, theoretical prediction. We could go into the details here, but uh, it would take too much time. But if we now make the measurement for the target state, what we see is that you know by and large over some range, uh, we get what we expect theoretically, but we also get large deviations. Right? We get clear anomalies. Uh, one around n equals 70 here and one around n equals 92, 93. So the question is, what's going on? And um, uh, since at the time we had no idea what was going on at all, uh, we performed the same measurement for p states, which involve another microwave photon for the excitation from the depumping, but that's not a big problem, and also for the d states, which I'm not showing here. And we saw uh, anomalies in, in all of those states, right? But in, only in the target lifetimes, not well, well, a little bit also in the in the ensemble lifetimes, but most clearly in the target lifetimes. So the question is, what what's going on? So we had lots of visitors at the time, and they all pointed us in the direction of background microwave radiation. So that was the, the instinct that we also had, because you know, let's face it, uh, the reason that the range that we're looking at, that uh, we did a a, brief, a quick model, assuming that we had some background radiation in certain frequency ranges, okay, and then did fits to our experimental data, you know, both for the S and for the P states and also for the E states, which I'm not showing. And then we came up with, with this curve here, which is sort of a, um, an empirical enhancement factor for the different frequency ranges. Okay, So we, we saw that in very discrete frequency ranges, we saw enhancements of the, uh, the black body or the, let's say, just the microwave radiation that the atom C, which then induces these transitions and shortens the lifetime of the target state. And, and of course, you know, in this frequency band from 2 to, to 14, we have 
the L band, the S band, the C band, and the X band, which covers everything from you know, wireless communication to weather radars, long distance radio communication, satellite communication, and so forth. So, uh, so this is very difficult to find out what, what it is. So the first thing we tried was to make things worse by simply putting very powerful microwave routers and all of the mobile phones that we could get close to the experimental apparatus and seeing whether we could make things worse. And now I'm wrapping up uh, half a year's worth of uh, data here. Um, and we could, we didn't see any measurable effect of, of those cell phones or of the, the routers. Then we tried the opposite. We wrapped everything up in tin foil, so built a Faraday cage, and then very painstakingly measured the, the actual shielding factor of that Faraday cage by building a microwave transmitter, which we put in the far corner of the lab, so it irradiated the, the entire room, and, and found that, that yes, so the, uh, the shielding wasn't complete, but it was about a factor of five or so compared to what we got without the shielding, and still we didn't see any change in, in this figure. So it, it wasn't background radiation. And, and then we took another look at the cell and said, hang on, let's work out from the dimensions of the cell and the surrounding structures what the, the, the ground states of, of the microwave modes are. And lo and behold, we did see you know, a very clear overlap, except for this first one here. And, and so we thought, well, could it be the geometry, right? Could uh, the, the geometry uh, somehow play a role? And uh, so first of all, we uh, now plotted this uh, measured Rydberg, uh, Rydberg transition rate, gamma EBR, against transition frequency you know, from our previous data. So we could compare directly to, to this figure here. And then we got another hint, which was that we saw regions where this was suppressed. Right? So we didn't just see an enhancement, but we also saw a suppression. And, and of course, uh, then we went back to the literature and saw that this was something that had been treated uh, quite uh, extensively, uh, well, not maybe extensively, but by some people in, in recent years. And here I want to make a, a brief aside uh, for the pros of knowing literature. So uh, if, if we had looked very closely at a few papers from uh, you know, the last 30 years or so, we would have seen that, you know, this was something that had been discussed. And especially in a paper by Josef Fortak, uh, they actually pointed out that uh, the geometry of the conducting parts of the experimental setup could form an effective microwave resonator or the BBR spectrum. So what we did was we now calculated the modes, okay, we just counted the modes in, in this cavity formed by, by the cell and the surrounding structures and compared it to Planck's formula and, and took the ratio and, and saw this figure here as a function of the principal quantum number. And if you compare that to our, our experiment, that actually you know, reproduces at least those two features here. They're not exactly the same, but of course we're making lots of approximations here. And then we went one step further and said, well, let's try to actively change the boundary conditions, if we change the size of, of the cavity by putting some extra electrodes and, and meshes so we can put in the, uh, put through the mod beams uh, to cap actually uh, trap the atoms, and then repeat uh, that calculation. And then you see, you know, you get a hmm, largely different results. Now you get to the, this maximum here is almost gone, but there's another maximum that comes up at a higher end. And we performed the experiment, and you can see here in this region, we clearly see that there is another uh, maximum of this gamma coming up now, whereas the, the, the previous maximum is, is strongly suppressed. And you can repeat this uh, with different Q factors, but I'm not going to go into detail here. And if you, so I've, I've hidden uh, this last few, these last few points here, because in theory, if we went to sufficiently high end states, which we can't right now uh, for reasons of background electric field, which we had to uh, already push down to a few millivolts per centimeter, and we have to go even below that in order to go higher. But in principle, we should be able to strongly suppress uh, black body radiation in that. Way. And uh, since I'm running out of time, just a few minutes left, let me just uh, say that we're also now working on getting some extra control over dissipation. Okay, so we said spontaneous decay can be interesting in studying these uh, 
open driven many body quantum systems. And especially when the driving, uh, the coherent driving is uh, comparable to the incoherent driving. So this is a paper by Igor Zanovsky's group. And then you, you get, uh, you know, this nice phase diagram, which you could map out if you could have uh, control over the spontaneous decay. And we're now implementing that using an additional intermediate state, which we can drive uh, at the same time as actually exciting the Rupert state. And so uh, having control over this dissipation as well. So a brief summary, what uh, have we learned, I hope, in this talk? Uh, so first of all, what do we mean by Rupert electronics? Then uh, that we have to be aware of the strong dissipation due to black body radiation induced population transfer. And that we found, or that we've got very strong evidence that the, these deviations are from theory are due to the geometry of the apparatus. And we can control that to some extent by altering the uh, geometry. And I should say here that there have been recent results by Luis Marcasa's group in Brazil, who have actually built a cavity uh, expressly for this purpose, and they've seen uh, the reduction that we are hoping to see uh, in, in the near future when we have a, a new apparatus. And, and also, finally, uh, to add control dissipation through an extra decay channel. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Rick, and thanks, Oliver, for the, for the great talk. I was wondering, do you see that there's a chance of doing a second type of Rydberg atomtronics, not looking for the transport as you do, but using the Rydberg excitation as a means to control the interaction? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you're talking about Rydberg dressing maybe, mostly here, or yes. Well, Rydberg dressing is notoriously a difficult subject. I mean, many, many people have tried and many people have failed. Uh, except maybe uh, for Manuel Bloch and, and Christian Gross who, who've done that using a, an SP transition in the ultraviolet because that there, when you do the dressing, the intermediate state actually does become a problem because you have to drive too strongly and then your coherence is limited by, by the presence of the intermediate state. But what, what I think might be interesting, so I hinted at that very briefly, is combining the uh, mechanical effect on the atoms with the internal degree of freedom, mm -hmm. right? You could, you could get correlations uh, in, in, in momentum space and, and also in, in the internal degrees of freedom. And I'm not entirely sure what, what we could do with that, but it just sounds like, like an interesting thing to look at, whether that might be used to, uh, you know, to study some, some effects. And, and, and I should say also that what we're most interested in is sort of percolation type phenomena, right? And, and there's the, all sort of this disordered conductors and, and, and what have you that we could uh, very nicely simulate with this kind of uh, replica electronics. But yes, uh, that, that's an interesting thought, and we're certainly also thinking in that direction. OK, thanks a lot.